All right, everybody, thank you for coming, joining us today on our inspirational interview with Max White, UK London painter. Before that, though, I just want to give you a quick review of what Artful Minds is about. And Artful Minds focuses on the artist's artistic development and growth by providing exercises, inspiration, instruction, guidance, discussion, and feedback all in one place. Uh, we do this through various skill development exercises, our weekly open office hours, monthly challenges, monthly critiques, inspirational interviews, and our upcoming master classes. You can find us and get more information at artfulminds.ca. If you want to see the public area of our community, you can go to community.artfulminds.ca. Perfect. And with that, I will spotlight Max. And a quick introduction for Max. He is a professional oil painter working in London, UK, whose artwork longs for authenticity in the expression of nature, something that can be enjoyed and related to by people who have no connection to the place or shared nostalgia. Thanks for joining us, Max. I really appreciate it. No, it's good to be here. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to scroll through some of your works. And if you could just do a quick introduction of yourself, that'd be fantastic. My name is Max. I'm 24. I live just outside of London, uh, UK. And um, I consider myself an impressionist um, and a sort of uh, objective painter. I say re representational painter. I work in oils, mainly, mainly plein air, obviously with a kind of drive to create some larger works in the studio as well. But most of the works that you're seeing at the moment, they're all plein air pieces. So a lot of them are done in, in London on the street. A lot of them are done in the fields, just the parks, so St. James's Park. That's a popular one. That's the London Eye uh, in the rain, which is one of the things we get a lot here. Lots of rain. Lovely. But yes, I think I like to consider myself an all-weather painter, so not really a fair-weather type. Uh, that in involves a lot of logistics. So very large easels, umbrellas, lots of different boards, sizes of boards, all travelling up and down London with the intent of trying to capture exactly what I see each time. Let me just go back to this one painting of yours, since we're here, this Regent Street painting. It looks like you were standing in the middle of the both streets on the median. How did you exactly capture that? Exactly in the middle. Really? Yes. And they let you, yeah. no one's honking at you, no one's giving you a hard time? Oh, uh, well, no, no, no one's giving me a hard time, but there are, there are always people honking at you. There, all the taxi <laughs> drivers will uh, pull up and uh, wind the window down. Uh, all the bus drivers will do the same thing. As, because I was there that day for about, I think it was it was in the middle of summer, so it was a very long day. I think you're talking sort of, you know, 14 hours of sunlight. And I think I saw the same bus drivers, the same taxi drivers about five or six different times. So that's they fantastic. sort of see the painting as it progressed. And that's one of those things you can do on a day like that. You can, uh, on a sort of overcast day, you can work for hours. No, no. I wouldn't and, even think about standing in the media and to uh, do a painting down that road there. That's pretty yeah. cool. The fire brigade actually showed up at one point. Are you kidding me? Uh, and uh, yeah, with the, with the sirens on, which was a little bit of a worry, I thought they're going to want to go straight down the middle. Yeah. Luckily, they were able to just pass by. The, the annoying thing was they actually stopped to look at the painting. <laughs> and I was sort of, I didn't know what to say because I was thinking, you probably have a better place to be right now. <laughs> no so, doubt, right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good. good. Good story, if I have to say so myself. So I took the liberty of reading your bio. And from your bio, I understand you drew a long time uh, before getting into oil painting and um, you drew a lot from uh, photos as we all have done. Everyone always uses photos when they're first starting out. Now that you have uh, the experience with photos and experience with plain air or painting from life, from still lives, etc., um, how would you compare the two uh, experiences, photos compared to life? That's a good question. I would say that you don't have to discriminate between the two um, too much if you have experience in both. Because when I'm painting from life, you don't have to fake anything. But when you're painting from a photo, there are certain aspects of it that you have to sort of recall from your time painting from life. Uh, one of them being the quality of the edges in a photo. Because if you squint at a photo, 100% of the time, the edges will sort of all become very, very soft. Whereas if you're looking at something with an actual uh, depth of field, so I can actually physically see the distance between certain things. When I squint my eyes, certain edges are going to stay hard and other edges are going to go soft. Yeah. But if you're painting from a photo, it all just goes soft. And it's yeah. the same sort of thing with values as well. But if you have experience painting outside, painting from life, you can kind of compensate for that. But then having started out painting from photos and only photos, I was actually painting from quite abstract photos to begin with. So 
things I was taking with old 1930s Art Deco cameras um, in black and white film, trying to add color into them. I think from that, I kind of, it's a very, very sort of, it's like stabilizers on a bike kind of way of learning values because you're completely stripping away all forms of, of color and you can focus in on exactly what you see yes. for a very long period of so time. Did you paint right on the photos then? For the first few years, I was, I was painting from, obviously from my laptop screen, you know, paint uh, what I saw, but I was editing the photos quite a lot. So I was, you know, taking out loads of colors and I was trying to make them very sort of moody. When you're doing it from life, it's, there's a uh, hundred different variables. It's almost like if you want the benefits of one, you're going to have to deal with the fallback from that. And it's, it's kind of like a give and take thing. If you, if you want to not have to fake anything, you should paint from life. But if you want a long time to do it, you should paint from photos. But then, then again, it's not black and white. You should really study both because, you know, since photographs have actually been around, people have, have been using them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's well documented that painters like Soroya, Zorn, all of the British Impressionists, all the way up to Sargent have all used photos at one point or another. And, you know, whether that's for values, for imaginative purposes, for compositional things, it's kind of just, it's always been a tool. It can never be, it should never be a crutch then. Yeah, I remember even, uh, well, the camera changed the way uh, the Impressionists started composing their paintings even, mm. right, back in the day. So it is definitely a tool. But I think a lot of artists these days, when they first start out, they forget that. They just want to paint from the photo and they end up painting a photo. And so that's one of the reasons why I asked that, because I just wanted to get your take on it. And, and without a doubt, it seems like you have to do both to be able to progress, right? I think a little while ago, I was doing some work for a hotel. This is actually uh, not a little while ago, about six months ago, I was doing a collection for a hotel and most of it was done plein air pieces and it was all surrounding areas of the hotel in London. But then there were some pieces that they wanted that were specifically inside the hotel and I couldn't get in to paint them. And so I was taking some photos and then painting those exactly the same way that I would outside. And you can't really tell the difference between the two, I, I think. If you'd seen the photos, you could, but... I think it's, um, it comes with not having a routine, but sort of getting into the idea that certain things look a certain way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's too bad they never let you paint it inside, though. I know. Yeah. Well, I, to be honest, I didn't want to be flying paint around in some of those rooms. Well, yeah, no doubt. It sounds like it's a prestigious hotel then, eh? Yeah, that's, yeah. I can talk about it now. The Stafford Hotel in okay. Mayfair is actually um, really popular with American diplomats, apparently. Apparently, Roosevelt stayed there once. Really? Man, that's a good commission. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's um I haven't I haven't been able to share any of the work yet, but soon enough. Well, soon I'm looking enough. forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. And if uh, anybody's wondering where they can find Max's works, you know, he's on the internet at maxwhiteartist.co.uk. And of course he's on Instagram. Uh, you can look for him at Max White Artist. All right, now with that, you're 24 and we had a little bit of a chat before we started this. And I think it's so great to see young artists succeeding in this especially when i hear about this commission within a prestigious hotel and one thing i'm interested in is kind of how did you get from where you were to where you are today that is a hard question to answer because i think there are so many different factors i guess the phrase is whether or not you're going to make it i don't feel like i've made it yet mm. um, but i do feel like i'm in a much better position than so many people that i already know and i'm very lucky i think that's part of it I was working a part-time job until, say, a year and a half ago. I think working every day is one of the things that I would say definitely helped. Painting at least one thing every single day. Nice. Doing one study. And then from there, and making sure that most of those, or as, as, as many of those as possible, are from life. Your ability will go up a lot faster than if you just, you know, tinker around with things once a week. Another thing is going to quite a few exhibitions as well, um, kind of seeing what the actual community was like in the country and trying to see where I'd sort of fit in and then eventually trying to get into those exhibitions. I think that is one of the things that elevated my profile quite a lot. Okay. Um, so there are always shows in London that you can, you know, open exhibitions that you can submit work into. Yeah. And as soon as I sort of knew which ones were the ones to kind of go for, I put my best work in and a couple of times it, it, it worked out. And then from there, people get to know you. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, how did you handle the rejection from those shows? Because obviously you want to get into these shows, just not only to show your work, but for um, the acceptance that your work is at a certain level, right? So how did you accept the rejection when you you applied and didn't get in? It's really difficult. It's <laughs> That's really, good to hear. Really, Everyone goes through it. Right? It's never, never easy. My friends always say that I take it quite hard uh, compared to the way that they sort of think that I should be taking it. But I think it was a little easier once I got into one mm. because I felt like from there, my work can't be too bad. Yeah. I think once you get into that first exhibition, you should take that as a, as a milestone and then use that to say, well, the next time, if I don't get in, at least I know that, you know, I, I'm more experienced now. So it doesn't necessarily mean my work has got worse. It just means that, the people that were judging at this time aren't the people that were judging it last time. Yeah, and you exactly. can't sway everyone. I spoke to one of the leading artists of one of these societies. I, th I believe it was the New English Art Club. I spoke to Peter Brown, who's the president at the moment. And I sort of asked him if he had any advice at all. And one of the things he said was, just apply for every exhibition you can. And you should always be in the mindset that if you don't get in, you should just tell yourself that they're wrong and keep doing what you were doing. <laughs> Have that arrogant confidence, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I think that's great advice because then you sort of don't, don't start beating yourself down and you don't start thinking about, uh, maybe I shouldn't be an artist kind of thing, right? And I don't uh, think you should ever compromise um, what you do for the sake of any exhibition either. No, I agree. Yeah, 100%. And to give everyone a little idea... Uh, Max is uh, exhibited with the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, the Royal Society of British Artists, and the New England Art Club. And getting into not just one, but all three of those at different times, that must have been a huge boost for your confidence. And as you said, your understanding that, yeah, the artwork I do is substantial enough to be approved by my peers. I mean, the, the feeling just must have been amazing, eh? Yeah, it really was. It really, really was. And, um, you know, you, you never really know whether or not you're going to get into these things. But I think if you just put your best in you know that might get in because you know it, it doesn't always get in because two years ago i got into the royal society of british artists and then the next i think two years later i submitted again and absolutely everything was rejected <laughs> so i think take it with a pinch of salt when you get rejections as as much as you do with you know succeeding i think if you accept that you have reached your peak once you've got into an exhibition um, that's equally as dangerous as beating yourself up for getting rejected. Yeah, I think I have to agree with that. Uh, and it all depends on the judges, right? You just never know what people are looking for. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet you if you submit those paintings to another exhibit, maybe they'll get in, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I know some people that will ex um, send the same piece into five or six different societies and, you know, it will, it will end up in two of them. Oh, damn. They didn't yeah. time. Well, I guess the timing has to be appropriate, right? The timing and then all the panels that judge these things they get rotated every single year yeah. and you know they're all artists and they all have their own set of beliefs and values that's true that's true 100 percent. you said you mentioned that you do a lot of plein air work but do you ever take your plein air work and just enlarge it in the studio for a bigger piece because you think you, it, it'll, it'll work yeah yeah okay. i do uh rarely uh very rarely it has to be you know the piece it has to gotcha. be the one basically um it's usually if i can envision it being a large piece or alternative it, it it has to have something more to explore mm -hmm. within it so for instance if i'm painting something usually a natural subject i might want to explore color a lot more and on a small scale it's quite difficult to do that and over a short time period as well so usually it's when i want to add something to the painting it's less so with cityscapes because it's quite, I think for me, it's quite easy to say what you've wanted to say in a very small study sometimes because mm. they're very, very simple compositions. That being said, it might, it might be worth taking a few very, very small cityscapes and blowing them up in size and seeing what happens. Yeah, it'd be interesting. So a lot of these stuff you entered in competitions are, or exhibitions are your plein air work themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, at the moment, it's, a, um, it's actually a 50-50 mix now. Okay. But I think this time last year, it was all 100% plein air work. Oh, wow. Damn. Okay. Now, do you do a lot of still life painting as well? or I do a little bit. Um, usually when I can't leave the house for whatever reason, maybe COVID has mm. got me. 
or um, maybe the trains have all been cancelled or or whatever. But usually still life work for me is something that has to be found rather than something that has to be set up. I, I feel much more comfortable finding a still life than I do creating one. So That's interesting. Most of the ones that you've that I might have on my website are all just views from within my studio. Yeah, that's right. Because some are just yeah, studio views, aren't they? Yeah, mm. that's an interesting way to approach it. Because yeah, still life setting up still life is not an easy thing, is it? No, exactly. I think it's it's kind of it's the same sort of mindset that I go into a landscape with. You know, I feel a lot more comfortable painting exactly what I see rather than trying to chop and change things. I think it's I think you have to master painting what you see before you can chop and change things as well. Yeah, well, well, without a doubt, yeah, you really have to understand what's going on, right? So you you paint urban and you also paint um, landscapes, the traditional landscape, trees, meadows, etc. What do you find more difficult? It swings and roundabouts. Um, I think at first I actually found the urban landscapes more difficult mm. because, and the, the reason changes. Uh, initially, that was because I wanted to get as much as possible into the painting and there's so much to capture in an urban landscape. And there are some great painters who managed to do it, but I realized after that, that I actually wanted to try and simplify my paintings a little bit better. And at that point, it started becoming easier to do landscapes because certain things in there were very simple shapes. And then now it's gone back to the cityscapes being harder because the landscapes have become a little bit more complex for me in terms of the things that I'm trying to observe. That's interesting. And yeah, it swings back and forth. I think there's always something, if you're following curiosity, there's always something more to cause a headache. Well, it just means you're learning, right? Exactly. Now, when you go outside and you find these places, what inspires you to set up on a location? I think usually it's the composition. Uh, I have to find a composition that um, hits me, I think, especially when it comes to a cityscape, because, uh, you know, the, there are so many different factors at play, but, you know, the architecture, the uh, whether or not it's going to, you're going to get run over. Whether the weather's going to suddenly change, uh, the angle, the boards that you've got with you might be the wrong shape for the scene. When you're out in nature, you can kind of find you can find a tree and you can kind of angle yourself around it a lot better than you can do with a building. Because usually in London, the streets are quite narrow, <laughs> so if you know you can't really step into the middle of the road sometimes and uh, paint something from a distance. So I think I spend a lot more time walking when I'm in um, an urban landscape than I do in, you know, the natural landscape. But the composition has to grab me. Yeah. So when you set up on the uh, streets of London, how accepted are you? Are a lot of people bumping you around or cussing you out or do they just mind their own business and walk around? I'd say 90%, 95% of the people just mind their own business. Okay. Um, out of the other 5%, mostly people just want to know what you're doing. Very occasionally you have people that want to tell you their entire life story which, you know, is, I've become less and less sort of tolerant of it. And I, I remember when I first started, I had some older friends who were painters who were saying that eventually I was just going to end up despising talking to people whilst I was painting. And I didn't believe them until I think about six months down the line when you have sort of a stream of people that, that are there that want to tell you everything that they've ever done or want to ask you every question they've ever had. Yeah. And it's... It's just difficult. It's just difficult. <laughs> and then in London, there's also places that you can't actually paint. And you don't really know where these places are. They're usually privately owned sections of the Thames. And they have private security forces that will wait until you've just started setting up your easel. Really? Squeeze out all your pens, paints, and then uh, they'll tell you that you can't paint that. Oh, that's surreal. That's really weird. So have you figured out how to uh, politely... Um move away from talking to these people while you're painting uh one of the things that i've actually found quite useful is headphones i think oh, if you okay. just if you go out wearing headphones even if you're not wearing you know listening to anything uh most of the time people will think that you're too busy to talk to yeah, if you're yeah. not you're kind of inviting conversation i mean it's quite easy to do if you're listening to um some ambient music or some podcasts I've gotten to listening to um podcasts while i paint you kind of get once you get into the zone it's a lot easier yeah, without a doubt. And with your urban landscapes, then you say you spend a lot of time walking, trying to find the right view. But what are you what are you looking for? I mean, is it all about the shadows or the the, the rain on the 
the ground or what is it that really attracts you? The main thing is a balance of shapes. Uh, so what that means is, so there won't be two very large shapes that are exactly the same size in the composition. It won't be a uh, divide of just two things. Uh, maybe there's a, you know, non a third, third, third divide of sky, ground, ground, or the opposite. But then sometimes there's also the conversation of whether or not I want to have a lead into the composition, which is one of the things I think is really important for me is not painting things that are you know, flat object, and then flat object, then flat object. There has to be a kind of a line that's something that's taking you in yeah. rather than just, you know, a, a, a disappearing line of things. Obviously this, you know, this doesn't apply to every painting, but mainly in an urban landscape, I would say you have to take these things into consideration because if you're painting a building face on, it's, you know, sometimes depending on the building, it's, it's quite hard to get the sense of, of depth or yeah. any kind of perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, so that seems to be your go-to way to compose your paintings as you're looking at things, right? Okay. That, that's kind of an interesting way to do it. Just worry about the mass of shapes being offset and non-symmetrical, I guess, is the way to think about it. Yeah. I'd say um, something, it has to have a sort of pleasing geometry to it. Mm -hmm. I guess a good example of someone who's kind of done this would be if you look at a Bonnard painting, they're very rarely uh, naturalistic in the way that they're drawn, but all of the shapes in them tend to kind of have quite a pleasing kind of arrangement, even if they are abstract or they've been skewed in a certain way. So being able to find that in the natural world is is paramount. Yeah. Okay. And then do you just do it all in your head and then sketch it on your canvas or do you do a few sketches before you jump right in? It, de it depends how obvious the composition is to me. Okay. If it's, if it's really, really obvious and it's, it's just like screaming to be painted, then yeah. I'll, I'll go straight in. But if it's not, I will do a small sort of thumbnail sketch about this big in charcoal in my sketchbook. Okay. Just to work out where the masses are. Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure everything looks the way you want it to, right? Mm. Yeah. A simple question, I think, but how important is mark making in your painting? That is more important now than it was uh, when I first started. I don't necessarily think of it as much as mark making as much anymore as, as, as much as brushwork. And mm -hmm. I think brushwork is really, really important to determining, you know, how the painting is going to come about. So uh, for instance, if I'm painting a tree, the brushwork is going to need to be different to when I'm painting the flat surface of a building, or even if I rarely ever do it, um, a portrait. If you're painting skin, everything needs to be relative to the object, I think. So I'm always thinking about how I'm going to lay in some things. And sometimes that's just as simple as working out the size of the brush that I'm going to use. So for a natural landscape, I tend to try and stick to brushes that are no bigger than a number four, which is relatively small. But yeah, that is. in the urban landscape, it's it, you can get a lot larger because you need to mash in, mass in some very large shapes. Usually. That's interesting. So you'll mass in an urban landscape, say the side of a building in one value with a large brush just to get it in in a flat sense, right? <clears throat> and then work with that. But with your your uh, more traditional landscapes, you'll stick to the smaller brushes to really give a sense of, of um, texture or feeling or... To be honest, it's, it's easier to understand if you think of it as being the exact same technique. It's by way of thinking about impressionism. It's just, um, I think um, Edmund Tarbell said this, it's, it's just getting the right spot in the right place, the right color, the right time, yeah. which you know, is, is impossible to do, but you know, it's easy to understand. It's kind of just working out what size the spots are in the landscape. So with a cityscape, the spots that you're painting are very, very large, yeah. or at least the transitions between them are more subtle. Yeah. Um, in the landscape, they can be the size of a leaf. And I think you have to reflect that in the way that you paint it. That's interesting. That's interesting. Question came in, uh, what size range of, uh, are your plein air works? I'd say uh, comfortably, uh, I usually go up to about, uh, for, for a work that would be a sort of a la prima piece, I'd say the maximum size for me is a 12 by 16 inch board. But if I'm going back for multiple sessions, which is hard to do in a country where the weather is very unpredictable. Uh, you can go up to, I think, logistically speaking, a, a 20 by 24 inch piece Okay, is sort of the, the maximum that I'm comfortable with. And that's, you know, that would be about, I'd say, three sessions for that to really be something that would be considered finished for me. Yeah. 
I, I feel absolutely comfortable painting usually at about 20 by 30 centimeters out and about, unless it's, you know, something that needs an extra session. Gotcha. And if it does need an extra session, I will, I will go back with a 20 by 30 centimeter board to the same spot just to finish it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And do you paint any smaller ones just for quick studies? I do. Um, I think I have some here. So I have these, which are just sort of like, um, kind of eight by five or seven by five inch okay, uh, yep. boards. And they're mainly there for things like sunsets, cloud studies. Mm, good point. Um, anything that changes extremely fast. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I think you brought up a good point about painting outside and doing larger works. Uh, I don't think a lot of people think about that. You know, you can go back the next day if the weather's just the same and continue on painting, right? Everyone thinks you have that one or two hours. Sometimes you're better off just coming back the next day and finishing it off. I think what you have to do is you have to spend a lot of time at the start dedicating yourself to getting, if you, if you are definitely going to not finish this painting in one session, I think it's important to get every single shape keyed in correctly. So for me, in, in any painting that I do at the moment, I, I just start off with just big spots of color roughly where these spots will go okay and then i can compare tones without thinking about drawing or texturing it's just thinking about getting all of the elements of the painting reading correctly and then yeah. from there if it suddenly changes i can work on the drawing or i can work on the you know as long as it's right i can work on more of the different subtleties in in the color yeah Going back to our mark making discussion there, I did read that you do like to use non-orthodox tools uh, like rollers and squeegees. Mm -hmm. Do you still use these? I do in, in studio work. Um, I wouldn't go out uh, in, and try to paint with them uh, in plein air, but usually that's on a sort of quite a late stage of, of a studio painting when I really want to get some texture in. I'll okay. use something like um, a, a sort of like a printmaking squeegee is, is one of my favorite things. Yeah. Um, and just use an extremely large amount of paint, just slap it on. But this is, you know, not thinking about, you know, the, the, the underpainting. The underpainting has to be right already. And, you know, when you're mixing up color, it has to be the right value, the right color and all that yeah. sort of thing. But this is, this is mainly for sort of a textural um, effect. If you want something to really come out of the canvas. Okay. Interesting. And then that, like you, after you do the roller say, do you adjust it afterwards or do you just leave it as is no matter what? Oh yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll adjust things to the nth degree to yeah, the point yeah. where sometimes it's probably not even worth doing it. But <laughs> I think even, even using something as traditional as a palette knife, I think you can only ever get one edge of a palette knife stroke, right? I think yeah. you would, you always need to go back and adjust yeah. something at least. Yeah. I think it's just, it's, it's the same with, um, all tools, you know, every, everything, you know, your first stroke doesn't have to be the one. Yeah. But. It would be, have you ever seen uh, Jeremy Lipking paint? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. I think he's the exception. Every stroke he does is the right one. I just, it yeah, boggles my it's, mind. He, right? he's, an, he's an incredible painter. I, I, I do believe that he, he really does take his time with the studio work. You can see when, when he paints, uh, one of the things that he'll do is he'll get the drawing perfect. Uh, to begin with, to get all the points in his, you know, large pieces. Yeah. So drawn out. So you'll have the nose, you'll have where the head starts and finishes compared to where the foot is compared to where the knee is and everything will be there. Yeah. And then he'll put a sort of very, very thin wash of, you know, uh, something as close to the value and color as, as he can over a large area. Yeah. So he is kind of, it's not all sort of, out of prima brilliance but it is brilliance at the same time yeah yeah he's quite amazing to watch now i'm curious how you work do you i mean being a planner painter you generally will go out and you'll come back and you have a finished piece but say for these commissions that you're doing how do you work do you work on one at a time or would you work on three or four that need to be done and kind of switch them in and out i think i like to give myself large projects to do which usually involve me working in one place for a little while okay and that's kind of rolled into the way that I do all work. So I will kind of, I will pick a spot, say Hyde Park, mm -hmm. and I'll go there for a week or sometimes longer. Um, at the moment I'm doing a spot for the rest of the month and I'll come up with some pieces there and then I'll go back another day, another and another and another. And by the end of that time, we'll have about 15 or so pieces and they will sort of start to feed off of each other. Okay. And that way, if I do have anything that's in progress on plein air, I'll be able to go back to the same spot if needs be. 
Mm, gotcha. And if you decide that this could work in another piece, let's say you're working on one the second day, you'll go back to the first one and make adjustments accordingly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And with the hotel work though, like you had to do some interior shots from photos. Um, did you just work from one photo on one painting until it was complete or did you kind of work on three at a time or? Well, with those, I was, I was doing them at the same time that I was doing the plein air work. Um, oh, okay. And I think that's, that's quite a good thing to do because your way of working doesn't get disturbed too much. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's for me, for me at least, I, I know other people might find it easier not to do this, but I need to be working outside as much as I am inside. Otherwise one starts ticking over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, usually working outside is absolutely fine to keep doing, but if I get stuck in the studio, it will start eating into my plein air work. You know, you can you can never forget the constraints that you have outside. Yeah, plein air is a different beast. Eh? Once you start doing it and enjoying it, you kind of really have to get out and do it no matter what, right? It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a drug when you think about it. <laughs> I know so many portrait painters who have recently been bitten by the sort of landscape, I think it's the landscape bug. Gotcha. You know, they'll be going out every single day, coming up with uh, landscape paintings. And then, you know, they're still amazing portrait artists. Yeah. But I think everybody gets a little bit hooked on landscapes every once in a while. No doubt, right? It's the immediacy of it all, right? That's what's so fantastic. Saying landscapes, it kind of reminds me of the big series going over in the UK, which is the Landscape Artist of the Year. They also have Portrait Artists of the Year. Mm. Now, have you, have you applied for either of those at all? I'm just curious. I have, actually. I've, I've, I've applied for Landscape Artists of the Year um, a few times now and They've mm -hmm. never actually wanted me, but I don't take any offense by that because I know quite a few people that have actually been on it and the reviews of the set from the set are, are very mixed. I, I don't think I've heard some, somebody have a pro, you know, a very positive experience being on camera for a long period of time. Well, no doubt. It's probably a lot different than just your average day painting outside at a park, right? I mean, yeah. 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 And then yeah. the sheer number of applicants they must get over there must be just astounding, right? Yeah. yeah. And then one of the things, you know, really difficult is they pick your spot for you. Yes. So they'll, they'll place you in a, in literally a bubble and you'll have to look at one thing and pick yeah. that. Yeah. And That's going to be the biggest challenge. Eh? It's a challenge, but you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it basically implies that choosing a subject, uh, isn't what makes you the artist. And I, I would personally say that it's actually almost the opposite oh interesting right you, that that saying pretty much indicates that if you're good enough you should be able to paint anything but in your mindset really that as an artist you should have the luxury of painting what calls to you hmm. technically speaking um i think if you had all right let's say let's say for instance there were 10 artists from the studio of corollas duran mm. who were told to paint a view the same view together they'd probably come up with um very similar paintings, but I think individually they'd probably choose certain subjects that would benefit them, you know, their sensibilities. And it's not necessarily a, a technical thing. It's, it's more of, um, I think that's what, if you paint what you want to paint, that's the creative force in yeah. painting you know, something, an observing color. Yeah. I think creativity is within your choices that you make. Good point. I said, keep applying. I'd really like to see you on that show. That'd be very yeah. interesting, right? I'll, I'll try again this year. Um, we'll see. It'll be interesting. A uh, question came in. Uh, do you chase your light in your work? Chase light. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I feel like all of the painting that I do is chasing light at some in, in some sort of regard. There are two ways of thinking about that. One of them is trying to capture the moment that you see. And one of them is following the light as it goes around. So in, in a certain sense, I do try to capture one moment of light, but I don't try to capture the light as it moves because I think that will give you a different painting. Yeah, so gotcha. gotcha. So do you ever, you ever hit a location and, and um, say you've been there before and you want to paint this and the sun really hasn't come around, but you'll start painting anyway, just because you know when the sun comes, you're going to have an amazing view? I have, I have actually done that before, but only in a location where I knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, yeah. With that, what I would do is I would draw out certain key areas, like certain points that I would definitely need. So say in the city, there was a, you know, the connection with the water to a building or the top of the building to the sky, I have those fixed in place. And then I'd be able to fill that in later. I think um, there's a great artist from America called Mark, uh, Mark D'Alessio. 
Oh, yes. Um, it's amazing. He, eh? Yeah. He always said that you're always painting into an effect or out of an effect. And if you're painting into an effect, it means that you are waiting for something to happen. And in that, you should focus on drawing. If you're painting out of an effect, you should be focusing on getting the colors right without worrying about the drawing. Oh, that's interesting. I've watched all his YouTube videos and stuff. That's interesting. I haven't heard that from him before. I like that. Yeah, he's a great painter. Um, now, saying that, though, has there been one artist that has influenced you more than others? <sighs> or two? Don't, don't think you have to be locked into one. I picked 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, out of so those 12, there's got to be some There's, cream the, there's the a top. good reason for picking 12. So they're mainly American artists, the ones that have influenced me. Um, oh, interesting. I would say uh, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of a, spe a spectrum of impressionists uh, that range from John Singer Sargent being, you know, in one extreme to Monet being the other extreme. And then mm. in between that, the 10, you know, the, the American landscape impressionists from that sort of era. And they've all, they've all connected with both of, you know, you know, both ends of the spectrum or at least once, but it's this kind of Boston school of, of artists, of impressionists, I'd say have influenced me the most. Interesting. More of the Boston impressionists more than anything, eh? I'd say so because they kind of found a way to fuse portrait painting with the landscape painting in a way that was at its fundamental level an impressionist kind of a mindset as opposed to something that was done you know in a 19th century realist setting they were painting they were always painting no matter what the subject was they were always painting color spots and uh, these, these are artists like um sergeant monet edmund tarbell frank benson uh willard metcalf and they all connected with each other yeah. in this kind of way that they understood that they were all trying to achieve the same thing, but they all had different sensibilities in the way that they did it or things yeah, that they yeah. chose to paint. Okay, that's really interesting. I would have thought that you'd be more of a influence from the European continent more than you would be the American continent. Um, I think it's it's funny. It's, it's When you get European art, it's mainly, you know, it, it, so it starts spreading to America when the impressionist movement kind of yeah. takes off and you know just before then but before then it's all very sort of it's it's i'd say the dominance of the old masters and their techniques is what kind of reigns supreme but that's not exactly what i i want to try and achieve yeah okay that makes sense oh something just came in excellent thank you uh do you paint only in oil uh when doing plain air or have you used gouache or watercolors as well i have i have I've used watercolors, um, not to create finished pieces, but to do studies before. Okay. I've, I've, I think for a while I was influenced by Turner in that respect. He, he keeps sketchbooks after sketchbooks of, of just clouds. Yep. And it would just be clouds. And they were all watercolors. And I think something about the texture of a watercolor kind of echoes that of a, um, a cloudy sky quite well. Okay, so I was sure. doing cloud studies from watercolor sketches for about three or four weeks. Nice. Um, this summer, actually. But I, I, I found it difficult to do finished pieces in watercolor. I tend to think of it as kind of a study medium. And it's the same with actually working pastels a mm. little bit as well. And that is kind of my color study mechanism. Because with pastels, it's quite, a, it's, it's, it's quite helpful in trying to work out how to create color through synthesis rather than from getting the right color and mixing it. You're kind of throwing on color after color after color, trying to yeah. chase the color of the thing that you're trying to paint. Gotcha. So yeah, there's more of an immediacy with the pastel than it is with, say, mixing with an oil or uh, an acrylic. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And you can kind of, you can gather quite a lot of color information in a very small area. Yeah. And I like that for certain paintings. Okay. That's pretty cool. And you haven't tried to gouache at all? No, actually, I, I haven't, I haven't tried gouache yet. Okay. I think I'm likely to do that. Yeah, it's one of my favorite mediums because yeah. it acts like oil so much. It's so opaque. Mm. And um, and watercolor, I'm just not good at it. And I think it's one of the hardest mediums out there. Um, it is. And, it I really stick, medium. yeah, and I really want to stick Yeah, and I really want to stick with oil. So I don't want to try to master watercolor at the same time. So I've kind of moved into gouache for the quick studies and stuff. And I really like it. Yeah, I've got friends that sort of um, hop between oils and, and gouache um, mm -hmm. pretty freely as well. I should probably end up trying it because it seems to be quite a versatile medium. 
Yeah, you never know, right? Uh, another one just popped in. I see your planner set up on one of your Instagram posts. We talk about your setup, including the almost a vertical, quite messy palette. Um, do you mix colors on that surface? Yeah, I, I get a lot of comments about my palette. I, I have two palettes. Uh, I want to clear this up. I have two palettes. <laughs> I have a, a palette where I squeeze the paints out onto, and I have a palette where I mix the paints. And so that way, I have this kind of these clean piles of paint each time and I will just dip my brush into those and I'll have a very small one which is um it's only about this big I'll have my hand and I'll mix the colors there it's kind of encourages me to step back a little bit as well I tend to work sort of sight size or a variation of and so if I'm standing back from the painting I can kind of I can take the long end of my brush hold it here dip it into the piles of paint bring it back and then step back a little bit mix it and then put it on the canvas. And it also helps because I use a, I use a French easel, kind of like a Julian model, but I got it from Jackson's art. And in it has a mechanism that stops the large palette from hitting the back of the easel. Yep. And that way, if I do squeeze my paints onto the surface, it's, it's going to stay fresh for, for quite a few days. Interesting. Oh, okay. I never noticed that. So kudos to uh, Shelley for picking that up. Nice. This is awesome. Any chance you have tried the new Yin Min... Blue. Uh, if so, what do you think of it? I haven't actually. Okay, yeah, I haven't been able to get my hands on it either, but uh, it looks fascinating. I tend to um, keep my colors quite consistent. There's more to uh, limited palette. Okay, yeah, that's actually a, that's a, that's a really good question. So when I'm painting now, I think uh, this has been my palette for the past six months, and will probably continue to be my palette. I don't like using earth colors. Oh, interesting. So, as of recent, I, well, apart from yellow ochre, because I find that cropping up in mixes is too much. And it's something that's very easy to mix from primary colors. For my palette, I tend to use cad yellow and cad orange. I use uh, vermilion and alizarin, permanent alizarin from Windsor and Newton colors. Mm -hmm. I also have viridian, cerulean blue, ultramarine blue. I have ultramarine violet and titanium white. I think that's all of it. And I, I, I'd like to use that because I like to think that if I, well, I don't like to think, I know that if I use earth colors, I will end up relying on, on them a little too much. I prefer to think of myself as kind of constraining the colors from, you know, their full potential than actually, you know, succumbing to using colors that are already a little bit dead. And that's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be like that. I do think there are some great limited palettes that are based off of earth colors. So the Zorn palette uh, being one, that's one of my favorite palettes to do skin tones with. And that's just vermilion, um, yellow ochre, black and white. And that works really well. Yeah. Um, another one is, this is a really good earth palette for things like interior paintings, certain landscapes. It's, it's, it's white, yellow ochre, raw umber, burnt sienna, black and ultramarine blue. And I actually used that palette for about six months last year. Interesting. Uh, through the winter months because everything got a little bit earthier. And there's you have quite a lot of um, a range of earth colors in that. Yeah, everything can be a lot more neutral in a sense too, right? I think it also depends on what you're sort of searching for. I think during that time, I was really concerned with getting the values right. Okay. And then color would be more of a concern of getting the warm and cool relationship. Yep. Yeah. And that, that makes sense then. That's a perfect palette for doing something like that. Eh? You don't have to mm -hmm. worry about the high chroma or anything like that. I would definitely recommend using as small a palette as you, you can, because, you know, that way you actually learn about mixing colors. Yeah. So, you know, at the moment I'm using all of these primary colors, but I'm pretty confident in being able to mix all of the earth colors that I used to use out of those primary colors. And I'm able to do that quite fast now so i i don't really have a need for any earth nice, colors nice yeah when you first started with that palette it probably took a little bit of a while before yeah. your head got around it eh? especially when you um want to try and mix black and i think you know the perfect mix of black i haven't i don't know if i've, I've quite got there yet but at the moment it seems to be a sort of ultramarine blue a very small hint of cad yellow and a bit of vermilion and that's as close as you'll get to black in that kind of palette. Interesting. I was good. I was very curious how you're going to mix like a black with that palette without a sienna because, you know, altering blue and sienna, you pretty much got it right there, right? So I was curious yeah. how you're mixing your dark blacks. I mean, it's, it's, it takes, um, 
it took some knowledge of the color wheel, uh, but once you you have that, you can work out how to make things neutral. So in that palette of all the primary colors, I have about five or six different neutral colors that I can make out of just mm-hmm. two. So you have ultramarine violet and caddy yellow. That makes something that's close to a neutral immediately. You have ultramarine blue and cad orange, and that neutralizes to almost, you know, yeah. gray. That's right. Um, so yeah, you, you really, you can make quite a few grays out of all these colors. And then also the, one of my favorites, alizarin, crimson and viridian. That's, that's one of my favorite grays to use outside. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all of those can be made from a primary palette. True. That's interesting to hear you about your mixes. That's amazing. One of the questions came in, what are your favorite brands and followed up, uh, which brand of vermilion? So at the moment I, I, I actually try to use Michael Harding paints for all my colors apart from alizarin crimson because you know at the moment people are discovering that it is a fugitive color which basically means if you leave it out in the sun it will eventually lose its uh potency i guess i believe they still do it but winsor and newton make a permanent version of that which is technically fake alizarin crimson but it still functions a lot better than the original kind so for all my colors i tend to use michael harding colors I don't, I don't necessarily think that the brands are too important. Um, so long as they're professional quality, I, I'm, I don't really discriminate. Yeah, you just got to find the one that works for you, right? Because I know I use yellow ochre, and there's quite a difference between Gamlin yellow ochre, Winter Newton yellow ochre, and a, oh, yeah. a local Canadian brand called Cama. Just the hue and the intensity of each is so different. It's finding yeah. the right one that you like to work with, right? And then, the, you know, the hard thing is, is, is figuring out, yeah, like you said, the right one. But then I think once, once you get that, definitely stick with it for as long yeah. as you can absolutely absolutely and wow this hour has gone by amazingly fast but yeah. we still have a couple of minutes so i want to ask you a couple other questions what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given best piece of advice yeah there's got to be something that sticks with you every time you go painting or i think one of the best pieces of advice that i ever got i i kind of got it quite recently and it's um that nature is already perfect and i think if you try and force your own agenda onto it, you will find things a lot harder. I think one of the things you need to remember is if you draw something correctly, if you get the right color, the painting will read. I think a lot of people get uh, very torn up in trying, I do, I know I do, it's it's, it's getting torn up into the idea of finish and the idea of, you know, technical styles, things like that. And I don't think it's of much concern to people as, as people tend to you know, to think about it. I think, I think people should be more concerned with trying to get things right. You know, if, if I was going to say the best piece of advice, I would say trust your eyes. Well, that's dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> dangerous advice. But you know, there's there's so much of it out there. I think yeah. there's so much conflicting advice. There's so much. True. You know, there's so many different techniques that people tend to talk about that are just personal to them that won't work for everyone. I think. One of the important things to remember is everybody is, well, not everyone, but uh, most people are just trying to do the same thing. That's true, right? We're just going about it different ways so we can understand it better. And how we describe it to ourselves may not necessarily work for other people, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's part of, part of learning because I, I never went to art school uh, or any kind of painting school. I think uh, one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, somebody might be saying something some way. And then three weeks later, you'll hear somebody say that somebody will mean the same thing, but they'll say it a different way and it will suddenly make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. This, those aha moments, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And following up with that question, what's the best piece of advice you could give someone? That's difficult. I'd say, you know, it's kind of a variation on practice makes perfect. I think you should always tr- endeavor to do 10 times as much painting as you do reading about it, because if you read too much well you you can never read too much but you can also never practice too much i think you should always practice more than you learn yeah because if you practice you're painting with your eyes you know you're you're painting with things that actually dictate you what you're you're doing if you tend to learn more through reading you're effectively painting with your ears and i guess this goes back to your real life experience that you just painted every day yeah and, and saw the results right yeah, exactly. In short, paint with your eyes instead of your ears. I'd, I'd say that's, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Thank you for that. 
And with that, I think that concludes our interview. I just want to say thank you very much to Max White for agreeing to this interview. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everybody who attended. If you want to check out Max's work, he's on maxwhiteartist.co.uk. And he's on Instagram. His handle is maxwhiteartists. And if you want to check out Artful Minds, we're at artfulminds.ca. And you can check out the public aspect of the community where you can see a whole slew of free interviews that we've put on at community.artfulminds.ca. Like always, we'll end abruptly. Say thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, Max. No worries. It was a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.